experimental archaeology, probably the most popular part of today's historical sciences. To replicate the exact capabilities of a historical firearm, first there are three basic factors we have to replicate. The first one is the human factor. We have to know exactly who used the pistol or firearm and how good he was. The second one is the firearm itself. We have to have excellent quality 100% condition originals or 100% accurate repros, which are hard to find. So go for the originals. And the third one is the cartridge. To be absolutely accurate, we have to completely reproduce the capabilities of the cartridge itself. Basically, there are two methods for reproducing a historical cartridge. The easy way and the hard way. The easy way is when we know exactly the muzzle velocity that was achieved in the 19th century. We have original sources for this. In this case, we just have to add the historically correct bullet and start loading the revolver with any kind of black powder until we reach that desired muzzle velocity. That's easy. The second one is the hard way, the impossible way. If we don't have the information about the 19th century muzzle velocity, then there is no other chance than to reproduce and uh, all the components of the cartridge, including the powder, the bullet, the lubing, and the, and the percussion cap also. This is impossible to do. So whenever we talk about historical accuracy and whenever we talk about experimental archaeology regarding the percussion revolvers of the Civil War times, as we do not know the nozzle velocity of the 19th century pistols, we are just guessing, we are just starting to go into a direction. But whichever method we can follow, you can be 100% sure that the first step is to have the historically accurate bullet. And now we can be happy because the first step to reproduce the historically accurate cartridge is ready. Mark Hobbs just designed the Johnston and Doe bullets for 44 caliber and for 36 caliber revolvers. So ladies and gentlemen, let's start the journey with learning the history of the Johnston and Doe cartridge works. The history of Johnston and Doe is not a typical success story. Algernon K. Johnston and Lazarus Doe patented their method of making waterproof combustible envelope cartridges in three separate improvements in 1861-62. In the beginning, the rifle musket cartridges and revolver cartridges were manufactured by Ilem O. Potter. As early as 1861 March, they established their own venture in Manhattan, New York, close to the East River in the 78th Street to sell directly to the government. The rifle musket cartridges were not a success, but the 36 and 44 caliber revolver cartridge orders were finally arriving from the US government. Looking for more business for their cartridge making capacities, they teamed up with Remington. From this point, each of the Remington revolvers sold to the government were equipped with 100 to 120 Johnston and Doe cartridges up until the 13th May 1863, when an explosion in the powder storage destroyed their production capacity. They again decided to team up with Ilham O. Potter, but the quality dropped significantly and finally on the 1st January 1864 the Ordnance Office decided to terminate buying Johnson & Doe cartridges. The main reason was the powder was generating too much and hard to clean fooling in the barrel and the cartridges were unreliable. They tried to sell out the existing stock, but finally on the 21st December 1864 the company was dissolved. Previously I told you that it is very very hard to make the exact copy of the original percussion revolver cartridge of the Civil War era, but let me show you my way of making so-called authentic copy of the combustible envelope cartridges made by Johnston and Doe. Look at these beauties I have here for you. My cartridges resemble the combustible envelope cartridges, but the construction of the envelope paper case is quite far from the original method. I use hair curling paper and roller to form the cases. First I form the bottom and then I add the side of the cone-shaped case. I use a sablon to cut the paper pieces to the exact size and form. The glue I use for attaching the part is simple hobby glue. You don't need too much glue, just add the very thin layer to the edges I have just shown. Now gently but tightly roll up the side to have a complete case. The edge of the paper must be parallel with the axis of the roller. And there you go, the case is ready to be filled.
The size of my cases are set for 30 grain charge and a round ball, so I trim them to fit the conicals and the 24 grains of black powder. The original powder charge is very hard to replicate, as the exact weight of the charge and the quality of the powder varied a lot, even if you talk about one single maker. Probably the closest way to charge your cartridges is to load 24 grains of 2F black powder. When you're done, just add some glue to the base of the bullet, place it in the case and you're done. Now the only thing you will need is lubrication. Back in the 19th century, the mix of tallow and beeswax was used, so I'm also dipping my cartridges into this mixture. Mark Hobbs' Repro of the Johnston & Doe bullet is an excellent design. It will fit most of the Repro revolvers as well, and obviously the originals also. It is a very close copy. The bullet base is 0.43 inches as cast from pure lead, so it sits well into the chamber and you also have place for the paper wrapping. The largest diameter is 0.463 inches, so you can be sure that it will fill the grooves if your chamber does not size the ball. The bullet molds are produced by Lee for Mark and all other parameters are following closely the original bullet design. The weight is 223 grains, which is also very close to the original. The length of the original cartridge is measured between 1.5 to 1.65 inches and my cartridges are within the tolerances as well. The weight of an original Johnston & Doe cartridge was between 200 and 260 grains, so I am not far from that either. The maximum achievable historical accuracy desires a good quality original. Well, this is my Remington made in 1863. It's a Civil War Marshall and Mark revolver with a beautiful mint bore. This will be our first test. The Remington New Model Army was manufactured between 1863 and 75 and it replaced the Colts in Army service. According to the serial number, this particular piece was manufactured in July 1864. The GP cartridge on the grip stands for Gilles Porter Main Inspector. All the parts of the revolver are marked with sub-inspection marks, indicating that all parts pass the inspection individually as well. The main advantage of the Remington was the solid frame. The system was stronger than the open-top Colts and the sights are placed on non-moving parts, increasing the accuracy of the pistol. If you start shooting a clean revolver, begin with snapping caps on each nipple to clean the vent holes from oil. My repro cartridges were quite easy to load. They fit well into the chamber and under the loading lever as well. I have repro nipples installed in my cylinder and they are just as undersized as the nipples of all repros so I have to squeeze the caps a bit to have a tight fit. So ladies and gentlemen, this is the first time ever that I'm going to shoot my old original 1863 Remington New Model Army revolver with a periodically correct bullet. Let's check it. Fires at all. Let's check the result. The recoil of the revolver is quite gentle with this load. With 24 grains of 2F Swiss powder, which is not the strongest. Hey, that's good. That's very good. Check this. 
excellent. The bullets and the cartridges were easy to load. And that group is just excellent. Look at, I have four shots nearly in the size of the ten ring and remember this is not a target shooting load, this is a, let's say, a quite authentic load of the original military cartridge. I have only two flyers but uh, that could also be caused by me, not just the bullet. It's not as accurate as the load I use for, round ball load I use for, for target shooting, but it is absolutely good. It's absolutely good. Just look at this four shot group here. Excellent. It is out of question that the most popular percussion revolvers of the Civil War times were the open top coats. I have an 1860, original 1860 Colt Army, martially marked, also so service in the Civil War. The bore is not perfect, it is around 92 to 95 percent. But I know that the accuracy of this pistol is very, very good with round balls. Now I'm going to check it out with the Johnston and Doe bullets. Colt advertised his 1860 army as it was made of silver steel, a light but strong alloy that receives spring tempering for the durability. According to the serial number, this pistol was manufactured in 1862, so it is two years older than the Remington. The hardly visible CSL letters on the grip stand for C. Samuel Leonard Main Inspector. The sub-inspection marks are also proof that this pistol was manufactured for the army and took part in the Civil War. The Colt Army is a fine revolver, but the open top design was a clear disadvantage compared to the Remingtons. It is understandable that Colt lost the army business in 1863. Loading the Johnson and Doe cartridges were just as easy as with the Remington. I cannot recognize any significant difference in this case. Ladies and gentlemen, it's Colt Army time. The usual code problem. The spent percussion cap is just under the hammer when it tries to hit the next chamber. So we'll have to remove it. That's why we all love Remingtons. because it's a cold, again. Here's the problem. Another percussion cap sucked between the hammer and the frame. Excellent, excellent design. Okay. I love Remingtons, did I tell you? Okay, last shot. Let's check it. Well, I know that the bore is not as good as on my Remington revolver, but I also know that with round ball, it has a quite decent accuracy. And I have to tell you that from a military point of view, this is okay. Look. I see only five shots here. Maybe there's a double, but I will have to check the video later to determine it which one. But the accuracy is decent from 10 to 5 meters. It's still in the size of the head. So I have to say that from the military point of view, it is acceptable. 
even with this old workhorse. Well, I have to say that the 1860 Army was not so satisfying, but I think that we can push the Remington to its limits. Why don't we try it at 50 meter? What do you think? No gems, no misfires. That's why I love Remington. Did I ever tell you? One, two, three, four, five, and maybe this is a sixth shot, so all are nearly all are in the target in the size of an upper body. And the horizontal spread is quite small. This is cause because uh, the front side of my Remington is so thin that it's very hard to see that exactly you're, you're setting your sights, the front side and the rear side, to the bottom center of the black area but it's a decent group also. Maybe not 100% experimental archaeology, but I surely had fun this day at the range, and I will continue the experiments with the 36 cal. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining me on this historical journey again. In the next part, I will continue with the 36 caliber revolvers. You've been watching the Cap and Ball YouTube channel, and if you like what I do, then please don't forget to hit the subscribe button. You can also support the channel on Patreon. You can find the link down there. So, stay cool and keep your powder dry. Until next time, ciao.